Chinese, amongst others, had picked up on this. And so, it, it's, no, it's Chinese, but it's also elsewhere. But, but it is really dominated by Chinese. So they have these, what they call gold palms in China, where a lot of Chinese will get up in the morning at 7 o'clock and have their tea and play the game nonstop, taking characters at experience level 0 or 1 and moving them all the way to 70. And that's all they do, and then they sell the character. And it's called gold palm. And, they, and there's documented evidence that you can actually make more money doing this than if you had a regular day job. <laughs> so it becomes a big source of it. This is a not, players who play the game don't like people who are there through this. Because when you're a serious player and you're playing the game, and you have this person who has no experience, but is at level 70, then this is not that much fun to play with this. Right? So Sony is really interested in finding out who these gold farmers are so that they could knock them off. And they, they have many ways of doing that. But we were able to build models to do this that went beyond anything they had in terms of screening gold farmers. And so what you see is that right at the heart of this is a bunch of gold farmers. For the ones who are trading with, you know, thousands of people. And it's what they're trying to do is they're selling these characters. Mm -hmm. It's making sense so far. So yeah. just the pictures you see get some interesting ideas. Um, I can tell you all the probably operationalized proximity and so on and so forth. But just to get to the results here, uh, I'm, I'm going to just touch the final result here, which I've already told you about. Let me touch on some of these things here. So in general, uh, the first thing was that there was a sparsity network. People don't create randomly. So you do create links. You're very selective about who you create links with. Uh, you do create links with people. Let me see. Oh, I think I shouldn't have jumped through those slides. That's a blind So that you can't see clearly, but what it says is the sparsity of the hypothesis that I just said. People don't create links randomly. They do create, create links with people who are already very popular. At least for two out of the four networks, people who are already well popular are more likely to become popular. So this is the rich get richer hypothesis. Uh, they do like to be friends with friends of their friends. They play with partners of their partners. So these are all things that we've known in the, in the offline world that also happens to drive what's happening in the online world. Then in terms of homophily, we found that people who are of the same age and the same experience also play online together. Now think about this. Age and experience is not so visible in the online world as it is in the offline world, except if you're playing with your offline friends, in which case you know they are the same age, and you probably join the game together, which is why you have about the same level of experience. It was not supported in gender. And we wondered about this. Why is it that gender doesn't seem to play an important role in this? And there are a couple of potential explanations. The first is about a potential problem with the data. This is the gender they report to the game. We don't know whether this is their real gender. Right? So that's always an issue. We could have, we know that there are that this population has some interesting situations where people misrepresent their gender in the game. That could be one explanation. The finding was very strong, and when we parsed it further, what we found was, and I think I have it, those results as well here, here are the detailed results for gender, is that there is a strong homophily tendency. Men love to play with men, hence the dissatisfaction of playing with their female partners that I mentioned earlier. Turns out women love to play with men as well. So there is a homophily male to male, but there's a heteropoly of female to male. And so that's part of the puzzle that really does run counter to some of the things that we may have found in the offline world, which is interesting. Then we, um, time zone, again, we found it significant that you're 1.5 times more likely to play with someone in your own time zone than in a time zone that's one hour apart. And that geographical proximity matters, you're 22.6 times more likely to play with someone within, within uh, 50 kilometers than between 50 and, eight, uh, and 800 kilometers. Um, pretty much what it is. So we found a whole bunch of hypotheses this way, and, it, and it, what is interesting is that it gives you an opportunity to get a window into interactions of what is impossible to get in the real world because we don't have cameras, and God forbid we don't want cameras to be able to capture all the kinds of interactions that we may have in the offline world in this case. So I'm going to end now um, with, with, um, with a demo to say, why are we doing all this? So I'm fundamentally here, sort of four things that we have talked about here. One is we've said, we have really good theories about why we interact with one another. We went through some of those. You indulged me as I talked about self-interest and social exchange and collective action and so on. <laughs> it's good that we have those theories. We now also have the data because of the ability for these the digital traces, the text mining, the web crawling, and so on and so forth. We have digital traces of data. So we have the theory and we have the data. The 
third part of this is that we also have good statistical methods to analyze it. I, I told you about the statistical technique that comes from structural signatures. It's called B-star. Some people call it exponential random rock <laughs> models of social network analysis. So that makes it possible to take the theory and build theoretically derived models so that you're going beyond just the description of the network to actually test hypotheses of the kind that I showed in the second step. So that's the third part of it. And the fourth part of it is that we have the computational infrastructure to run these analyses. Because you can have a theory, you can have data, you can have a statistical technique, but if you don't have the computational cycles to run the analysis, you're still not going to get it. So now we are at a happy convergence where we have all of those four things. The computational applications is still a little slow, but with better scale applications, we are able to get there where we can actually analyze these large networks. So it's the, it's the perfect storm of these four things, theory, data, methods, and computational processing that makes it possible for us to do these analysis. But at the end of the day, you could still say, it's great to get these insights, but what do I do with it? So this is the part where I sort of move away from network science into network engineering. And that is, can I use these insights about why we create and maintain resolved network links to make recommendations to people about which new links they ought to be getting into? Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. Taking the science of how things happen to try to engineer a new kind of it's not enough to tell someone, you ought to talk to this person because she or he is an expert. We've already established that. You need to talk about the social and technical incentives that would make it possible and enable that person to do it. So it's sort of moving from understanding a network to enabling a network, creating new kinds of things. So as part of that, um, one, of the, one of the fun things about working in this area is that I'll occasionally get called by, unfortunately not so occasionally, often get called by different groups that says, we want to create a network. One such group was in front of the National Cancer Institute. So the National Cancer Institute has been funding tobacco research for a very long time. We now know that the light cigarette, the low tar cigarette, is actually no less carcinogenic than the regular cigarette. You're just as likely to get cancer from a low tar cigarette as you are from a regular cigarette. The irony here is that the data, the research, in support of this, languished for 10 years before people realized it. Why? Because there are epidemiologists funded by the National Cancer Institute who found that shortly after the introduction of the low-tar cigarette, there was a more aggressive, pernicious form of cancer, but they didn't link it to the low-tar cigarette. There are people in smoking laboratories, I never knew these things existed, but they do, right? They wire you up and they make you smoke cigarettes and look for your physiological reaction. They had noticed that people who smoke light cigarettes inhale five times more smoke than people who smoke regular cigarettes. Five times more smoke. What does that do? That increases the exposure to carcinogens. Because you're, you're inhaling that much more, because the cigarette is considered elastic in that sense. And the smoothness of the cigarette makes it possible to inhale so much more. But they didn't make the connection. A third group of people do reverse engineering of cigarettes, because folks in the tobacco industry, and state perhaps, is part of the problem there, is not one that tells you what the ingredients are sometimes. So there's a whole set of laboratories where all they do is reverse engineer cigarettes to see what are the ingredients. And they have found that the low tar cigarette had additives of unknown carcinogenic consequences. But none of these things have been put together. So there was one supposedly idiosyncratic uh, researcher at the University of California in San Francisco. And he happened to read these articles and went to the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, and said, you know, I wonder if there's a connection. You've spent hundreds of millions of dollars of funding all of these research. All of this was pretty much funded by the National Cancer Institute and a few other big uh, foundations, but NCI funded the bulk of this. Would you be willing to spend two million to commission some research to take these three networks, three parts of the network that don't talk to each other, and see if you can bring them together and see if something comes up? And lo and behold, one year later, they were able to prove without any doubt that the low tar cigarette was in fact no less carcinogenic than the regular cigarette. So then they came and they said, oh, we gotta create networks. So they created a network. Mm -hmm. It's called the Tobacco Surveillance Evaluation and Epidemiology Network, TC. And then someone else says, oh, but we need to create a network for tobacco harm reduction. These are the people, by the way, who say, okay, we, we can't get you to stop smoking at least we wanna be safe. It's kind of like the drug needle exchange policy, but in the tobacco network. So the tobacco harm reduction network Another group out of Johns Hopkins said we want to create a global tobacco reduction network, GTR. <coughs> so we had all these networks that were created, 
And so then what do we do? They said, we've created the network, but these people, how do we get these people to actually find one another and connect with one another when they wanted to? So they came and talked to me about it. And we said, well, you know, the obvious thing they were thinking of was we'll set up a portal where everyone can go and exchange information. I said, you know, that's great. I'm happy to help you do that. But what I would like to be able to do is use this as an opportunity to do some active social networking as well, and what we call social networking, so that they can be understood. It. So this is what we did. We created this thing called the Tobacco Behavioral Informatics Group, or TOB. But you'll see there's a tab here called networking, and that's the one I want to focus on. This is where we took the ideas from what we understand in theory and apply it towards creating new network links. So I'm logged in here as Scott Weishaw. Scott Weishaw was at the time at the National Cancer Institute, and he was setting up this network. He's now at the University of Arizona Cancer Center, and he's given permission to use his account for this. So it's important that I log into an account, but just so you know, I gave I give a talk about this uh, at NIH a few weeks ago, and the guy in the audience said, you know, you're violating HIPAA regulation by logging in on someone else. In a sense, he's right, but I have, I have his permission to do this, so we can live with this. Here's what happened. I'm logged in as Scott. I go to this tab called networking, and what we did was, without, without having to disturb these very busy researchers, we took all the researchers who were being funded by the NCI and Tobacco Research. We took all their documents that they published from, from PubMed. We did a text <coughs> mining on that, and now we were able to get a multidimensional network where we have people, documents, and concepts that came out of those documents. Right? So that's the multidimensional network. So now I can look at a list of those terms here, and you see the authors are there, and these are the keywords that came out of it today. A keyword that is very important in smokeless, is smokeless tobacco in, in tobacco research, because that's a big area of controversy. So here's where I can come back to that fishnet example that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, I can say, just show me the network associated with smokeless. It's going to take some time to launch. Oh, okay, it came up to us with Java applet. And so what I do now is I look at this graph, and I can cluster it. And it shows me that if I'm interested in smokeless, the three people that I might be most interested with are Tomar, Kristin, and Hatsukami. And then those are the documents that are associated with these people. So this is great in my seeing a fishnet of what are the people and concepts associated, people and documents associated with the concept, right? But what if I wanted to then do something else and say, if I'm Scott Leishow and I'm interested in getting a referral to talk to somebody about this topic, then I click on the search this film thing, and it shows me 10 people, 10 documents, and 10 keywords that I may want to recommend based not only on their prominence, but based on their position in the network vis-a-vis -vis me. So how I might be connected to that. So I looked down this list. Not surprisingly, you'll see that Hatsukami, Tomar, and Kristen are at the top. But the rating now grades amongst them because based not only on their expertise, but where they may be connected to me. And then there are other people. So I can look at someone like Gary Giolino, who is actually a co-PR on our NSF grant from the same digital governance program that Gary is, uh, is familiar with. This is a project that is funded through that uh, through the digital government program. I click on Gary Giovino, click on why, and it brings up a screen that shows me why I should talk to him. So I'm Scott Weishaw on the right. I'm interested in smokeless tobacco, which is this node here. And yeah, the smokeless tobacco. It says you should talk to Gary Giovino <coughs> because he wrote an article called Trends in Smokeless Tobacco Use Amongst Adults and Adults in the United, in the United States. Now, I can click on this link between me and, and, Gar and Gary, Gary G, you know, that is. And what it'll do, whoops, I clicked the wrong link. Let me go back here. So now if I go back to this and look at the report, it says, you and Gary have all these things in common. You have six keywords in common. You have three people in common, and you have two articles. Now I want to take this back to the theories we talked about. What it's saying is, I'm giving you, Scott, an incentive to talk to Gary, and I'm giving a Gary an incentive to be able to connect with me, because you have homophilies. You may not have known this, but you have all these keywords in common. You have balance, because we know people like to be friends with friends with their friends. These are three people who are co-authored with each of them, so you have all those common connections with each other. And then finally, you have two people who are both citing you, so again, that expresses other people's interest in you. So what this is showing is an example of how you can take the theories and the, and the ideas and the insights that we get from the science of networks and then use it to make recommendations or to help engineer new networks that are able to make you go to somebody who's not necessarily a competent jerk, but a competent person who now sees that they have a lot more in common with you than you might have realized there. So I'm going to start.
stop with that. I know I'm already perhaps uh, over time here, but happy to take any questions. If some of you have to leave because you're running late, you should feel free to do that as well. So is that okay if I stop here and take questions? Yes. I'm curious about sort of if this if the system like this were to really take off, what do you think the second order effects would be and how people start interpreting mm -hmm. data? Because in exactly. a sense, right, it's fairly difficult for me to identify that we have a colleague in common and for me to email right. somebody and say, I met you because we talked to somebody right. at a conference. Right. If I can generate these on the fly a thousand times a day, how much are people just going to say, well, yeah, maybe you know somebody I know, but I don't really want to talk to you because everybody can identify somebody that I know that you know. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. I, I, I think the, 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 the honest answer is we don't. Part of, part of what the research would do is to do that. But at the same time, um, what, do you, what are there others? I mean, I'd be interested to get, get insights into that. So the, if I'm summarizing your point is that as people begin to do this and as this becomes more common, if and if and as this becomes more common, then does the value of this go down? Are we going to look at some other motivations for why we want to build that collaboration? There is an established literature that says, you know, as more and more information is available on the web, that value of that information in some ways has gone down, and you value the private information that you get from your social network that is not on the web, right? And I think you're saying is this becomes commonplace, then are people still going to be motivated by this because I may have a hundred people come and tell me your friends are friends.
that they study transportation patterns all the time and how it affects behaviors. And what we find there is that obviously even within the game, co-location matters a lot because there is a threat. you're more likely to have two kinds of activities. It matters if you are in um, places that are, so places like parks, places that are gathering, you know, watering holes. So if you're co-located in those places, you are much more likely to be able to build up network ties. But not, of course, if you're co-located at places that are not meant to be gathering holes, like uh, places where you go to take, in, in, in these games, you have places where you can take a vehicle to fly somewhere else, for example, within the game, to teleport, etc. So as you go and wait, wait in those areas, co-location doesn't make a difference. Which again, you know, sort of resonates with the offline world, that just because I'm hanging out at a bus stop with someone may not mean that I'll talk to them, but if I'm going to hang out at this place we went uh, for lunch to the, to the top of the hill, yeah, yeah top of the hill, right? And then I was told that there was this sort of central meeting place around there that people in Chapel Hill get together to celebrate basketball victories. I remember one such victory involving uh, the defeat of the fighting line when I'm still at the line, which I'm still missing. But that's where they get together. So that's a common location that you come together. So co-location in those places is much more likely to increase communication. On that particular thing, I just mentioned one of the study, one of the findings that I thought was very interesting. It's not a direct response to your question. It turns out that in the real world, my transportation colleagues tell me that transportation and travel is associated positively with socioeconomic status. That people who are well off socioeconomically are more likely to travel, either for recreation or to conduct sort of deals that are done you know, by pressing the flesh rather than done electronically. It turns out that the same transportation analysis we did it for people moving around within the online world because we have they sort of coordinates within the game as they move around. That that's not true. There's a negative correlation between travel and uh, people in the online and, and, your, and your wealth in the online world. So the rich people in the online world stay put in one place and have their minions travel and do things for them. <laughs> well, that's the opposite of what we notice in the in the in the offline world, for example. I'm sorry. You There's also. chose to go Absolutely. into a dungeon and run it for yeah. seven, run several in an hour, so we're intentionally right. associating with right. each other in a physical right. location. So that actually is a source of, uh, of confound here, because you don't know which motivated which, you know, are you, are you there because you were already friends, or do you become friends because you're out there? Well, it's both. And it is both, yes. And, and that's, by the way, also true in, the, uh, in these previous studies, you know, it is a correlational study that said that you're 50 kilometers away, that you're more likely to communicate with people 50 than beyond that. And our ethnographers who are on the team tell us that most of it is because you're taking your offline friends and putting them online. But there is one slice where we know that there are people who meet people online, discover that they are geographically co-located with them, and then become offline friends with them. Right? So you're more likely to selectively stay connected. You may meet people from all over online but you're more likely to select and stay connected over a period of time with those who, who are geographically co-located with you. And the one area where that is clearly much more so is all the websites that have the, the matching, the love matching websites, right? <coughs> what happens there is that you're going online, preferably to find someone who's geographically co-located with you, right? So that you don't have to go on this kind of situation. So that's one area where the, the causality is in more in the reverse direction. But by and large, it is in the, in the forward direction. Yes. We have time for one final question. We have a class starting in five minutes, so I know it's been fascinating, but <coughs> fortunately, we have time for one final question. So go ahead.
ironically, because if you're lonely, it means you don't have a network, but it means that you do, that if you network with other lonely people, you're going to be lonely. Right. And so all of these are not contagious in a, in a, in a strict epidemiological sense, but they're all contagious because you are clearly being influenced by the networks of people that you are when it comes to smoking, obesity, depression, or in terms of loneliness. So this has resulted in a lot of interest in now being able to say, can I use mobile devices to say that instead of what their study showed us that obesity is contagious, can we use mobile devices and engineer networks so that the reverse of obesity may also be contagious? In other words, that fitness could be contagious in this case. So this project that, that I have, and I'd be happy to send you um, some summaries of that that we have so far, is you build mobile devices that allow you to see who you want to connect with, who may be able to motivate you in terms of your, in terms of uh, eating better or quitting smoking. The questions there are, do you want somebody who's much fitter than you to be your buddy, or do you want someone who's marginally fitter to you to be your buddy, for example? And th there's arguments to be made for both of those, and it's an open empirical question. Likewise, do you want to have somebody, uh, uh, do you want to give them an incentive collectively or individually? So you can say, you get so many points if you lose X pounds, or you and your buddy get X number of points if you both collectively use, lose X number of pounds. So there's a lot of really interesting work there. I see outside a bunch of people milling around. So thank you so much again.